Welcome to the Greyhound Star Zoom, uh, recorded with Ian Foster this morning. Unfortunately, due to a technical issue, uh, my pictures aren't available throughout the video, which I'm sure we can agree is a bit of a bonus. So I'm joined today by Ian Foster, one of the candidates for the forthcoming election for the owner's rep on the Greyhound board. Um, I don't know Ian, I only know him slightly by reputation through No Duff Racing. Ian, I've had a quick look at your resume and uh, an interesting character on all kinds of levels, which I'm sure we can go into. First of all, noting that your history, your Greyhound history goes back to the 1970s. Yes, uh, my best friend at school, his parents ran the South End Retired Greyhound Association. Uh, they had a lot of railway carriages in their big garden. And I used to spend quite a lot of time over there with him. We used to raise money for them, look after them, you know, take them on walks, that sort of thing. And that's ultimately what got me into greyhound racing. Um, we lived very close to the track in South End, that wonderful part grass, part sandy track. Uh, and so we became greyhound regulars and we brought our first dogs together. Excellent. Now, in fact, I seem to, I saw a reference there to, uh, to Albert Skelton, who I think we can agree was perhaps quite a controversial character in his time at South End. South End had quite a few controversial characters. <laughs> Albert Skelton was an excellent trainer. I'm not going to say he knew how to start and stop, but my friend Tim and I used to put on some of his money with the bookies, and so they were very scared of us because Albert was a very competent trainer. We also had a chap called Cecil Law. I don't know if you remember him. I know Cecil very well. Still see him. Well, Cecil's famous for taking on the... Um, sports governing body at the time. Any lawyers know about the um, Cecil Law case because it was quite important in its own way as he was challenging the di disciplinary process. We also had Tom Lanceman, Maria Dennis's father. He was also a trainer there. Um, but yes, we used to spend Sundays over at Albert's Kennels taking the dogs for walks and um, we enjoyed ourselves so much. And that's what set up my love of dog racing for life. Yeah. And then moving on, there's Pete Wellen. Uh, obviously, at, uh, would that have been at Bristol? Yes. Um, at that point, I lived down towards the Gloucester Way, and I could um, meaningfully get to Bristol, and subsequently, when Bristol closed, um, off up to Hall Green in Birmingham. But um, Pete Weller used to train quite a few dogs for us, including a sprinter that won one of the Opens on the last night of the Bristol track. That was Comfy Blue. Uh, I see there's another Comfy Blue about now. So it's interesting how the names come to be recycled. But yeah, well, Pete Wellen trained quite a few dogs for us. OK, now I'm going to I'm going to compact this a little bit. Um, and there's no disrespect, but you've got such an interesting story that unless I compact it a tiny bit, we won't get anywhere. Um, you then became an owner at Hall Green. You then moved with Stuart Buckland, who you say is a, a, a very good friend, uh, onto Monmore. You have the No Duff Racing. Um, but I wanted really then to move on to, to your, your, sort of your private life and your, your professional life, um, because you are by profession, um, or one of, one of your professions, um, certainly a, a qualified lawyer and, and, and a long practicing lawyer, or certainly were until you retired. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to start with, I went in the army, but I didn't stay in the army all that long. Um, I was in at the time of the Falklands, but it soon turned out that my job in the army was literally to waste other people's time. And I wasn't going to have a career like that. So, yes, I went to university. Yes, I qualified as a lawyer. And I ended up with my own practice, essentially advising other lawyers, government departments, insurance companies and handling quite complex and expensive litigation. So I believe that puts me in good stead to actually deal with the GBGB at board level. It doesn't phase me at all to be operating at that sort of level. I've come across a lot of very cantankerous and awkward judges, barristers and other lawyers in my time, and I can handle myself plenty well enough not to be phased by any of that. I'm certain you can. And which leads on to... I don't know, that's bizarre. I don't think I've ever come across a lawyer bookmaker before. Explain your bookmaker ties. Absolutely. Um, I remember very well the last time I backed a favourite. It was 1984 at South End. 
Um, we had an A3 bitch who stayed very well and we put her into a maiden open and she was six to four and we got our wheelbarrows out and we backed her. That was the last time I ever backed a favourite. I don't back favourites. As a bookmaker, I was there primarily to lay them. We all know the majority of punters like to back favourites and that's what I was there for. I used to like to back my opinion, both at the horses and at the dogs at Hall Green and Coventry. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed pricing up the race, making a tissue, deciding what I could take on, what I couldn't take on. And for me, Betfair and the advent of the exchanges spoilt that a bit. You couldn't take on everybody in the country who's sitting at their computers in their bedrooms and their living rooms you can only take on what's in front of you and Betfair took a lot of that away from me uh, and I ultimately sold all my pitches because of that because I'd lost the enjoyment that I used to have before in being able to have a view and not just be a trader on Betfair which so many of the books are now. The, the one thing I'd add about that is um, whatever I do I like to do it 100%. My wife is always having a go at me about this, about being over-involved in everything I do. Um, but one of the things I did then was to be a founder member and director of the ARB, the Association of Racecourse Bookmakers. Um, we were based at Knoll, just outside of Birmingham. So not only did I appear at the racecourses, I did my best to influence the policy and represent the interests of the other bookmakers. And that's what I tend to do in everything I do. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I'm standing for this position. I just hate being involved in something, looking at everybody moaning and groaning, but actually doing nothing to try and remedy the problems that they see. I'm not like that. I may not succeed, but I always want to try and remedy the issues. And this, I think, is a way of trying to achieve that. I, it's interesting because when we're looking at your platform uh, in terms of, of uh, what you'd like to achieve at the board, one of the things you state as your main purpose would be to basically become um, poacher come gamekeeper in, in that uh, you want to pursue the betting industry for, for more money for the greyhound industry. Explain how that would work. Yeah, I never had any off-course shops. I purely stood at the race courses. So whilst we made a contribution, it wasn't massive in terms of the industry at all. Um, I've never been part of the off-course industry. They pay a ridiculously small amount of money as it stands. As people may know, they're obliged by law to pay 10% of their horse racing turnover back into the horse racing sport via the compulsory levy, 10%. Greyhound racing, they choose voluntarily to pay 0.6%. That's not right. There is no logical argument to sustain paying 0.6% in one area and 10% in another. It's not that greyhound racing is less profitable. Um, as we now know with industry SPs, the SP comes out at 127%, give or take a fraction every time, because that's how they manipulate it to be they're laying most of their bets in the low 130s. Have a look at the horse racing returns, for instance, for yesterday, and you'll see that uh, aside from the 30 horse fields, the overrounds vary from 106 to 117%. That's for all the horse races yesterday. We as greyhound racing enthusiasts are having to bet at 127 to 130 when there are only five or six runners. That's scandalous. Since they took over the SP mechanism, they've made more and more and more money at our expense, yet we've got absolutely nothing back. And we've got to change um, the situation and we've got to make them pay more. Now, it's pretty evident that they're not voluntarily going to do so. They have to be forced at every step of the way to make any concession at all. And the only thing we have in our arsenal that I can see that will firstly bring them back to the table is to pursue the idea of a compulsory levy for greyhound racing. And whilst I put forward various what I call tinkering issues for owners uh, in my statement, my number one goal is going to be to pursue getting a compulsory levy for greyhound racing. 
How do you feel then about the structure of the board as it now is, where it could be argued that there is a very, very strong bookmaker presence, both in terms of the Entain director and the fact that you have ARC representation as well, uh, ARC and other promoters via tracks that they that they uh, contracted to. Um, the bookmakers already have quite a significant input into the board already. You will be presumably be taking that on. I would be. Um, I think somebody needs to. The point about pursuing the levy is that as it stands, the board, as the regulator for the sport, is liable to the government in the form of DEFRA. And what we've got to do is change the way that the whole board and regulatory industry is set up. As things stand, there are so many conflicts of interests. It's something that doesn't appear anywhere else in administrative or governmental law. We've got the regulatory board, which is dominated by promoters and external betting influences. One of the reasons I think Paul Carpenter resigned as the previous holder of this post was that he felt he couldn't achieve anything because of that bookmaker and promoter domination. I probably shouldn't be saying this because they won't like it, but the only way we can alter that because of the way that the GBGB was set up is by outside influence. And that ultimately requires an act of parliament, just as an act of parliament was required to establish the levy in relation to horse racing. So I nail my colours to the mast now. That is my overreaching objective. They may not like it, but it's got to be done. It's the only way we're going to increase the derisory 0.6%. And I anticipate that if we get a couple of like-minded MPs on board to actually pursue this as potential legislation, I guarantee the off-course industry will be wanting to have a meeting, they'll be wanting to have a renegotiation, and we can at least get the amount of money substantially increased, even if we can't fundamentally change the way that the board is set up. No, no, very good point. I mean, my understanding is that they, they always had, when we were within the EU, they always had a, a, a the government always fell back on, on, on an excuse that uh, basically they couldn't include greyhound racing. The, the fact that horse racing had a levy was a traditional thing that goes back many, many decades. Um, but it would have been contrary to EU law to, to, uh, to make changes that would benefit greyhound racing as well. Of course, that is no longer pertinent. Um, do you think it's realistic? Do you think the government will listen? Well, for the last six months, I've been approaching the DCMS um, and the minister involved. They still maintain the view that it's not long enough since they researched the matter last to countenance any change. But I've also been speaking to people outside of the immediate government circle. And the one I've been speaking to most is Tracy Crouch MP, who used to be the Minister for Sport not that long ago. And she's very much on side with us in this. She comes primarily from a welfare perspective, that there isn't enough money currently available for welfare. And of course, the more we bring into the sport, it's not just a question of money available for prize money. There's more money available for welfare. And she and another group of MPs are very keen on this idea of bringing in the compulsory levy to force the bookmakers to pay more. She's quite influential, of course, because she was the Minister for Sport. She's very much on side. I've spoken to her several times. Uh, and I think certainly if I had a position on the GBGB main board, that would carry a lot more weight with her and her colleagues to start the momentum to actually get something presented in terms of uh, a draft bill to take the matter further. There was an early day motion uh, tabled in Parliament recently that doesn't mean very much. She described that to me as parliamentary graffiti. It's just so that the powers that be know that there's an issue that people feel strongly about. And that early day motion was to achieve um, a levy. So there is the basis of a movement. We've been slightly, I think, hampered by the unfortunate situation in Ukraine, which has a lot of the MPs concentrating on, frankly, more important things. But nevertheless, there is a swell there. And I think we, we, we can jump on that. And there is a prospect. I'm not guaranteeing success, of course. But I think there is actually a prospect of making some progress on this. 
Fabulous. Is there anything else now that you'd like to bring up, um, sort of freewheeling on in anything that you'd like to, to bring forward to this discussion before people choose how to vote? Um, this isn't Westminster. It's not Holyrood. It's not party politics. I don't want to get into the position of saying anything negative at all about any of the other candidates. And Jane and Alan are be categorically about this. I don't really know anything about them at all. The, the fourth candidate, however, is Kevin Boothby, who we all do know something about. Um, Kevin has been a breath of fresh air as a promoter. There's no doubt he's done all sorts of great things for this sport as a promoter. Um, he's open to new tracks in an era where we're used to seeing them disappear rather than start afresh. Everything he's done as a promoter is great, but he is a promoter. I know he owns more dogs than anybody else. It's reputed to be over 200. I don't know if that's true, but he's a promoter first and foremost. My guess is there are a couple of thousand owners in this country. I, nobody really seems to know, but it's in that ballpark. In terms of promoters, there are, I think, 11 or 12. Uh, he owns and regulates as many tracks as either Entain or Arc, four tracks. That makes him the joint biggest promoter in the country. It isn't realistic to say that he's an owner first and a promoter second. He's a promoter first and an owner second. And whatever his intentions, and I'm quite sure that he's gone into this with the best of intentions, I don't think for a minute that he's stood to be mischievous in this, but there are going to be situations where there's a conflict of interests. And the two biggest things that are raised negatively about the GBGB are firstly, that there are way too many promoters. And secondly, that they frequently have conflict of interests that they don't deal with properly. They don't recluse themselves and step back. They vote, notwithstanding their conflicts. And I'm sorry, but Kevin is going to have a conflict of interests. I know he's told you previously, but he wouldn't have, but that's not realistic. So whilst he is an outstanding man who makes an outstanding contribution to the sport, I don't think this is the way for him to do it as an owner, because primarily he's not an owner, he is a promoter. And I would suggest that there is a proper route for promoters to obtain their positions on the board. And that's via the Racecourse Promoters Association. They appoint four at a time. Uh, it's like a block appointment. Unlike this and the trainer's position, we're not subject to, we're subject to election, but those promoters are not. And frankly, even if some people don't like this view, that is the way that he should have gone to be appointed as a promoter director, not as an owner director. In my respectful view, the last thing we want is yet another promoter on the board with an obvious conflict of interests. The only, I'm sure you know my, my response to that, because it will come up, um, it is impossible for Kevin to be voted into the board as a promoter because of the way the RCPA is set up and simply with block voting, um, he simply couldn't get enough votes to get onto the board as a promoter. So, you know, it, it is, a, it is whether this is the right route to be going is a different discussion. And I, and I can, you know, I really do take them on board. Um, <coughs> whether or not the, uh, the Greyhound board should be looking at the RCPA and asking them to, uh, to review their, I don't know, their, their, their setup, their, their, their I don't know the, the, the correct legal term for, for, for the rules and regulations, but as things stand, then there is a little bit of a, a black hole in terms of a someone like Kevin Booby, who will soon have four tracks um, getting onto the board. I think the GBGB should be looking at the way the RPCA is set up. Um, I, the one thing I would say is he would have more of a voice within it than without it. And currently he's not even a member of it. But we're straying down a path that I really didn't want to go down. Yep. I don't want to say anything that could be perceived as being remotely negative about any of the other candidates. This is an unpaid position. This is something we're putting our time forward for voluntarily. There's no pay whatsoever in this. And the fact that four people have chosen to do so and put their hats in the ring is a positive for the sport, I think.
I absolutely agree. And there's one thing that uh, I thought shone through um, your, your resume of, of, of your interests uh, as to why you wanted to get involved. And you are clearly committed to a good, solid, um, I don't know, uh, I say commitment in, in, in terms of time, time and effort to, to, to achieve something significant. Yeah, I, I took early retirement at 57. Um, so although I'm getting on a bit, I don't think I'm too old to do this role justice. Most importantly, you know, being retired, I've got the time to get it, dedicate to it. I can spend as much time as transpires to be necessary to achieve as much as I can. I've certainly got the enthusiasm and drive to get on and achieve something. Ultimately, will it be possible? Well, we'll only find if, out if I get to try. Ian, it's been absolutely fabulous. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I'm sure this is, this is going to be very, very well received. It's very, been very, very interesting. And um, best of luck. Is it uh, all votes in by April the 1st, isn't it? I think it is. Yes. Thanks for the opportunity, Floyd. No problem.